Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Idealia Phillips. I am president of the League of Women Voters of Hillsborough County. On behalf of the League, welcome to this event, Gun Violence is a Public Health Issue. As many of you know, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization. Our membership works to effectively engage with voters and government at all levels to empower voters and defend democracy. Curbing gun violence is a matter of public safety and public health. The League will continue to support common sense solutions to gun violence. The Hillsborough League is privileged to have a highly active gun safety committee chaired by Nancy Gronda and the healthcare committee co-chaired by Angela Birdsong and Laurie Winkles. Angela will now come forward to the virtual mic and introduce our, I'm so proud to say this, our state president, Patty Brigham. Yay. Angela? Okay, I am overjoyed that our state president could join us. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say that I did have a gun violence issue. Recently, my uh, podcast co-host decided to uh, show uh, suicide by gun just recently. So this um, topic couldn't be more timely. Um, our state president joined the league, the league um, the Florida League State Board in 2015 and was promoted to first vice president in 2016. After joining the League of Women Voters of Orange County in 2013, she quickly assumed leadership duties the following year. And she formed the League of Women Voters of Orange County Gun Safety Action Team. And she later, that was later adopted statewide. And she was also appointed to the League of Women Voters of Orange County Board of Directors and served two years. So we're just so excited because this obviously has been a, um, an issue close and near and dear to her heart for many years. And of course, um, we know what happened with the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando County. So, I mean, excuse me, in, uh, in Orange County. So we are, we're just so happy that she could be with us to discuss an, an issue that is um, it, part of society and we got to deal with it. And I would like to introduce Molly. Molly took over as the leader for all the gun safety committees around um, in the league a couple of years ago. She's been extremely supportive of all of us. Her meetings are very timely and she comes from a background as a professional photographer who uh, witnessed a lot of gun violence in her position. And when she got married and had children, she decided that she wanted to put her focus into ending gun violence. She feels that the most important way to do that is through um, ensuring voting rights and that people exercise their um, free right to vote. So we wanna thank Molly for her leadership and direction and helping all of us throughout the state on the gun safety committees. Are we ready to go ahead? Yes, we are. Patty Brigham, everybody. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for this invitation. And Angela, I am very, very sorry to hear about your, your friend and it sounds like a colleague. Mm -hmm. and that is really sad and we're very sorry. And we will actually be discussing the issue of uh, gun violence with, and suicide tonight. Okay. So one, uh, once again, thank you. And I'm delighted to be here with Molly Doman. She is our terrific state gun safety chair and she's been about, the gun safety chair for about a year now. So she's doing a terrific job. So I think that if you could go ahead and share your, the screen and we can start the PowerPoint. We have a presentation to show everyone tonight about the issue of gun violence as a public health crisis. There we go. Molly? Yes. Do you wanna... Um... Oh, there we go. Okay, I see it. Okay. Um, uh, last night I was on a call and um, uh, Dr. Alicia Battle, who's the uh, public health uh, uh, dean at uh, Tulane University, uh, described. I loved her description. She said, um, "Public health is the air we breathe, the food we eat. It's everything." She said. 
uh, and I, we'll come back to this, but public health done well is a team sport. So, um, and kind of uh, in this presentation, my argument um, and, and my, um, what I'm trying to convey to everyone is that if we take a public health tech, we could possibly find a cure. Um, because we have seen uh, with nicotine, for example, um, and smoking, who thought we'd be where we are? But it is, uh, uh, but that, you know, um, we, with the success with public health safety uh, approaches, uh, the approach through public health and, um, and science and research, we're seeing such success. So um, that's, that's kind of what my, um, my, my little argument to make tonight is, and um, what I think is uh, what's gonna make us su more successful locally and in Tallahassee and across you know, our fingers um, uh, nationally. So um, I think we have something, uh, some pretty interesting, you know, we all, we all have different, um, uh, um, issues that we really care about in, in our leagues and we all, you know, are in our different, uh, committees, but I think, I think this can be used in every committee, um, because what we're really asking for is, is, you know, as we said, as I, as she said, it's, um, public health is everything. So we're, we're looking for, it's the, you know, the greater good. So anyway, so Patty, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I think we have a little technical problem. Please bear with us. We do need the next slide for those who are working. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, yes, that's what we need. Thank you. Well, let me just give you a little bit of background about the League of Women Voters because we know that not everyone here is a League member, but we hope that that will change tonight. The League was established, uh, if you could go back to the full screen, please. The League was established in 1920 when women got the right to vote. And that means we are 100 years old this year. And uh, we've been very happy about our centennial year. And we were going to have bang up celebrations throughout the year and a big state wide party. And then COVID-19 came along and said, no, you're not. So we are just celebrating in our homes and toasting each other virtually. Men were accepted into the league in 1974. As we like to say, men are in, in the League of Women Voters. The league is made up of two, the state league is made up of two organizations. We have our education arm, our C3, and we have our advocacy arm, our C4. So we research and we do studies and we reach consensus on our policy positions. We educate and we advocate. We serve the voters and we promote good governance. We believe, if you can say on that slide, please. We believe that um, an informed voter is a responsible voter. We also are a nonpartisan organization that does not take political positions on candidates or political parties, but we do take positions on policy and we uh, continue to do that every two years at our uh, state convention. So with that being said, I will turn to Molly. Uh, okay, so uh, what is the public health issue? Um, you know, we know uh, disease prevention, prolonging life, promoting health. I mean, we all kind of have gotten a, uh, a crash course in this uh, uh, because of COVID. We all kind of are watching the scientific method play out and we're seeing solutions and we're seeing prevention. And um, so it, for the sake of gun safety, uh, let's say uh, 
gun violence prevention and prolonging life and promoting health. And uh, the metric for this is uh, uh, the seriousness of a public health issue is when, when you look at the seriousness of a public health issue, it's the average annual number of deaths caused per 100,000 persons by a specific cause. Reason this is important is that has ha that's how they measure, the CDC measures the, uh, the seriousness. Um, uh, the founder of public health said, uh, the science, it described as the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through organized efforts and informed choices of society, organizations, public and private communities, and individuals. That was CEA Wilson Winslow. We do this all the time. This is nothing new for us, right? So uh, I really, I, I kind of, I love, uh, I love just that concise definition. Um, if you could go to the next slide, I wanted to, uh, while you're going to the next slide, I'm going to explain to you, um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a mom of two boys in addition to, to being, uh, the gun safety chair. And, uh, it's a very difficult, uh, if, if you can just, when you get a chance to move to the next slide. It's a very difficult uh, subject to broach with your eight-year-old and not really my three-year-old, but my eight-year-old. But he does have uh, shelter-in-place uh, drills and he, um, he is aware of what I do. So given that we spend so much time together now, he said he wanted to help me with my presentation when I was working on it. And so I decided that I gave him concepts and he, uh, he could inter interpret them with his, uh, with his Legos. So it's not at all to trivialize, but I wanted fresh uh, illustration for this issue. And uh, we talk a lot in my family, we talk a lot about where a gun is stored in the home. We talk a lot about sh why the shelter in place, why the SRO is at the school. So uh, this this is his vernacular now. Um, so anyway, if you can go to the next slide so we can see what I'm talking about. Anyone? We do need the next slide, please. I'm sorry, I've been talking. I can see it. I don't know why it's not visible to you. Let me minimize it and see if it'll... I apologize. It's always such a learning curve doing these things. Always. Of, cor of course it is. We understand. Let me get this up again. Let me advance to that screen. We may have to just not have full screen for, I don't know why it's doing this, but That's okay. let me go to slideshow. I don't think we can see it. Uh, I need, you need to share your screen. Right. I wish I could help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Is that there at all? No. no. Okay, it tells me I'm screen sharing and I've got it up. So strange, it's, it's completely dark. I believe as uh, a co-host, I can share my screen. Oh, that'd be great. Let me make sure you are a co-host, yeah. Let me. Ah, oops. Sorry, I accidentally muted you. That's okay. Do you want me to share my screen? Yes, I'm just gonna make you a co-host. I'm scrolling down to, you're now alphabetical. Well, actually, 
There you are. Boom. Great. All right, let me see now. There we go. There we go. Thank you. Um, okay. I may not be able to. Okay. You're obviously going to see the notes, but I think that that's okay because we want to can proceed with this and get this moving. Okay. There's your next, your next slide. There we go. Okay. So as I said, I, uh, gave him concepts. I gave him the ideas and I, I just want to point out how staggering it is that, um, there are more gun deaths than there are car related fatalities. That is how much, how do I say this? Let's just say the public health approach for seatbelts and um, safe driving and speed limits has all worked very well. Nothing has worked, nothing has been implemented for gun violence like this. So um, uh, I, I, how the CDC uh, decides, again, decides the uh, seriousness is in America, they call the cause-specific mortality rate for gun deaths. Um, so your, uh, in this comparison, there were 11.9 deaths per 100,000 people in motor vehicle traffic deaths at the same year. So uh, as opposed to 11.9 for motor vehicle, there's 12.2 per 100. gun-related deaths. Not all are, um, are uh, homicides, suicides, accidents, et cetera, but those are the differences. So it's pretty, pretty significant. I never, uh, I forget what year. Patty, do you know what year that flipped? It was somewhat recently. It's not a, not a good benchmark, but it is something that did. I don't recall the year. Yeah, okay, it was somewhat recent. Okay, next slide. Okay. Okay. Um, why does it matter? Obviously, why does this matter? Um, if we take this public health uh, attack and we say it is a crisis? Well, uh, in other words, as I said earlier, we're trying to achieve a cure. Uh, COVID is, we're not there yet, so I'm not going to use that virus, but Ebola was pretty remarkable. Um, uh, if we use the Ebola uh, outbreak as an example, the public health community addressed it immediately, established an evidence base for studying it. So as we've watched with COVID and we watch sometimes on, um, uh, you know, with politicians, people are picking uh, and choosing their science. But uh, we didn't do that with Ebola. We didn't allow that. Uh, we put prevention measures into place. Uh, we assessed any knowledge gaps and the federal government appointed a, an Ebola czar to coordinate the response. So uh, as you can see in the notes, this was only because of a handful of cases. Now, Ebola was more lethal, but it was uh, nevertheless, um, it, was, it was really great um, uh, success uh, as far as how it was dealt with. Um, but uh, with, with public health, you, you know, um, we also, with, with gun violence, with, with all public health, we really need to start trusting the scientists. Uh, uh, track it, find the root causes, find the research gaps, create policy solutions, and use public education campaigns. We do a lot of the public education campaigns, we in the league, and, um, and so we're here for that. But we also need the data uh, to 
help us, again, locally, in Tallahassee, and nationally, if we are going to change hearts and minds, and more importantly, uh, find a cure. So next slide, please. Okay, so I believe very, very much in this. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to, um, um, let's see, I, uh, when it comes to making decisions for uh, myself, my family, we always take the scientific approach. What, what did the doctors say? What do the scientists say? Um, and this was uh, from, uh, gosh, I wish I had his name. Let me see in my notes if I have him, because I hate, oh, it's in, it's in the, I, I credited him at the end. Um, uh, he okay, go ahead. okay so anyway um this physician said health epidemic epidemics don't end unless we intervene taking the best science about what does and does not work and using it the epidemic of intentional gun violence can be reversed with a science-based approach that to me and i get really excited about this that to me gives me hope and i'll tell you why um, the longer I advocate for gun safety, the more I believe in the importance of this because uh, we, we all know how what happened after Sandy Hook, right? There were parents who stood in the halls of uh, the Connecticut Capitol and showed pictures of their children and they cried and they told these stories and uh and that's me and that's most of you uh they 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 they're they're raging they've got um uh, uh i'm sorry to be graphic but sometimes you know in that situation they had uh holes the size of oranges in their five and six year old children they were they were ignored. So what do we do to kind of, to win them? Um, we bring them to the table, uh, we, we talk dollars, we talk science, we talk less in hyperbole and less in what ifs, and we show them what is. And if we give our leaders, examples, and um, frankly, if we say it's less expensive uh, to have everyone living, uh, uh, everyone to not uh, um, uh, be a victim of gun violence, which, you know, right now, everyone knows someone or has been somewhere or is is almost been a victim or you, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, if we can show them, uh, what if that can be the change? And again, this is the public health approach. Next slide, slide please. Oops. Okay. Um, Add something, please. Um, yes, please. Connecticut, after Sandy Hook, did in fact pass some very strong gun laws. Congress failed. They failed to pass expanded background checks. And I recall watching a film about this, and it was painful to see the senators standing around the floor of the Senate. No. I said Connecticut. I meant, you know what I meant, so I'm sorry. Uh, standing around the floor. Standing around the floor of the Senate and talking while oh the legislation failed. And one of the parents was very upset and Are said, you interested in life insurance? I'm hearing background noise. I'm sorry. If, if you're not speaking, would you mind muting your microphone? Thank you. Uh, it said, shame on you, and of course was escorted out by security, which was you know, it's, it's what they do, but it was, it was, it was shameful. It was absolutely shameful that the Congress failed to pass any 
federal gun violence prevention legislation after a horrific mass shooting that killed 26 people and so many children. So they are still uh, not looking at the facts because the NRA has had such a control over our Congress and many of our state legislatures, including Florida. So with that being said, Molly, go ahead. No, I appreciate it. I <laughs> State and, uh, and federal level, I mixed it up. Um, so uh, what is preventing gun violence prevention? And uh, I think this is um, uh, really fascinating, but also uh, has, we're, we're kind of having a hopeful uh, outlook at the end of this. Um, so uh, right now, gun violence is the least researched of the top 30, of the top 30 causes of death in America. And that's due in large part to something that happened in 1996 called the Dickey Amendment. Um, Congressman Jay Dickey um, put in this uh, amendment and, uh, uh, you know, this language that said none of the funds made available for injury prevention and control at the centers of disease control and prevention may be used to advocate or promote gun control. This stalled us and uh, it's, it was really bad, really, really bad. We could have used in that time, lives could have been saved in my opinion. Um, legislation could have been made to save lives. Um, now, this is of course, in, uh, you know, in addition to all the other legislation um, uh, that, you know, has thwarted our um, uh, I have a side note that I, I found really profound when I was looking into this, which is that, uh, the late congressman said, I just regret it. I don't know if it was a change of heart. I just regret that we didn't maintain the commitment to funding science and research. In fact, I don't think we, I ever intended to be a prohibition against spending money like that. It just shouldn't be spent for political purposes. What he was basically saying is, look, this shouldn't have been a political game, right? And uh, I thought that was really interesting. So uh, next slide, please. Unless somebody has something. Wait a minute, that's not the right one. Okay. Molly, which slide do you want? What number? I want to go uh, to uh, the next one. Um, so, so I'm kind of taking you guys chronologically. So uh, this is slide number eight. Here we go. Okay. Um, unless you wanted to add something about the last one. No, go ahead, Molly. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> uh, just uh, 2018, um, remember, we're still not getting any kind of research from the CDC, uh, 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 money devoted towards it. Um, uh, uh, for gun violence research. So uh, American College of Physicians published this paper and they say, um, we, you know, uh, the, the, here's their, their public health approach to reducing death and firearms. Clearly threatened, uh, the NRA replies with, someone should tell the self-important, and I think many of us remember this day, I, I was shocked. Uh, so much to tell the self-important anti-gun doctors to stay in their lane. Half of the articles in the Annals of Internal Medicine are pushing for gun control. We all know that that's the gun control is not a phrase we use, but anyway, most upsetting, however, the medical community seems to have consulted no one but themselves. So uh, the next slide, please. Okay, so what happened, and it, I can't, it was just, it was heartbreaking and empowering all at once, was uh, physicians came out with the hashtag, 
this is my lane, this is our lane. Uh, this one in particular said, hey, NRA, you wanna see my lane? Here's a chair I sit in to tell parents their kids are dead. How dare you tell me I can't research evidence-based solutions? This is my lane, this is our lane, the quiet room. So a lot of the photos they shared are um, really graphic and they, um, not graphic, graphic in, uh, here's my emergency room after I just tried to save a patient who didn't live. And it was this uh, groundswell of rage that, that you would tell the person, as we know, uh, as Floridians know, and has been documented so well, what the, what the doctors after Pulse had to do and what they did and how miraculous um, their efforts were, um, uh, you know, to tell them it was kind of the final, the final straw for these, these doctors who are seeing, you know, carnage that we can't imagine. Um, so, um, let's see. Uh, so, uh, if you could scroll down on the notes, for some reason mine aren't showing here. Thank you. Um, I thought this was really important. So the paper's co-author is the uh, Academy of, um, uh, one second, sorry, one second. Uh, the American College of Physicians, Senior Vice President of Gun Government Affairs and Public Policy, Robert Doherty. He had enough. He said, uh, he went on to the NRA, he tweeted, and he said, uh, he started vouching for the scientific method used in the paper's findings. So I think if anyone is a scientist on this um, or, or physician uh, on this call, um, you can come for me, but do not come for my data. And I really loved that. And he said, all of our recommendations are supported by a comprehensive review of research on the causes of gun violence and policies that could reduce it. Where the evidence is li limited, we say so. Uh, all our recommendations were reviewed and approved by ACP physician members who serve on our health policy committee, several of, of whom are gun owners. Doherty also noticed, noted that the paper called for increased funding. So he's saying, look, the research is here. The evidence is here. You, wanna, you can come for me, but you know it's here. It's, it, and it, this has been peer reviewed. It's very, very important. Um, and again, we've all gotten kind of a crash course in uh, the scientific method lately. And uh, it's, it's something that you cannot, um, when you have the research and the data, uh, after it's been so thoroughly vetted, you, you can't argue with it. So next slide, please. Uh, okay, so uh, after countless mass shootings and pushback to the status quo, in December 19, 2019, Congressional leaders agreed to set aside 25 million for gun violence research, uh, marking it the first time in more than two decades that federal taxpayer money has been pledged for that purpose. So what we're seeing is um, we are, it, it, now they haven't repealed the, the Dickey Amendment exactly, but they are saying we're not going to uh, be beholden by this anymore. Um, so then, of course, as much as this was a victory and as, as happy as this made all of us, uh, shortly thereafter, we know we live it, uh, quarantine happens and or pan, uh, the COVID-19 happens and the pandemic happens. And so to the best of my knowledge right now, this is all up in the air, what the CDC is going to do with their money. Am I, I mean, Patty, can you weigh in on that? I believe that's correct. Okay. So uh, it's hard 
to um, ask them to, you know, hey, look over here, we still have a major <laughs> epidemic going on, um, but it is, it is what it is. But we do have, um, we do have support. So that is a very good sign. No, I think Patty, you're, uh, yes, yeah. here you go. Thanks, Molly. Mm -hmm. So what does the League of Women Voters of Florida do when it comes to gun violence prevention or gun safety? Well, we do monitor, certainly, the many gun bills that uh, are often filed. And I will say that there was a time when the gun bills that were filed were all terrible. Uh, guns on campus, open carry, and of course, we all remember Stand Your Ground. And of course, Florida is the birthplace, really, of Stand Your Ground, as the uh, NRA lobbyist, Marion Hammer, uh, with some of the legislators, authored that piece of legislation. And uh, it was, of course, passed. And then Stand Your Ground began to spread to other states. But its birthplace was really Florida. So we do lobby to uh, go after those types of bills. And we promote gun violence prevention at the local and state levels. And I will tell you that in 2016, after the Pulse mass shooting in Orlando, the league had a statewide committee in place on gun safety. And we knew that we had to start playing offense. And you know, we were always playing defense because of these bad gun bills that we were able to keep from passing. But we knew we had to get get serious and try to get some proactive legislation. So we formed the Florida Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence with our great partner, the Campaign to Keep Guns Off Campus, based in New York. And we partnered to work on keeping those gun bills off campus. And we now have 100 organizational partners. Uh, the co-chairs are Angie Gallo of the Florida PTA and Andy Pelosi of the campaign. And on our steering committee, we have the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, National Council of Jewish Women, Equality Florida, and a number of other March for Our Lives and some other organizational representatives. And then, as I said, over 100 organizations are in, in our, our coalition. And the mission of the coalition to uh, get a ban on semi-automatic assault weapons in the state of Florida, because that is the weapon of choice in these mass shootings, AR-15s, for example, uh, it was a Sig Sire uh, AR-15 style weapon that was used at Pulse. We also want expanded background checks to close the loopholes. And we want to repeal Stand Your Ground. So the, the coalition formed and we started doing a lot of uh, programs around the state, which the league was already doing. And then with, we have this amazing woman down in Broward County. Her name is Barbara Markley. And this woman is unbelievable. She's been able to get a gun show shut down. She helped us build the coalition. And she founded the Lock It Up program, which uh, began with, I believe, the Veterans uh, Administration or the department giving, donating hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trigger locks to the program. And they've been able to distribute those trigger locks and local leagues are now doing it because those trigger locks, if you haven't seen them, they look sort of like a bicycle lock and they go around the trigger and they lock it. And one of the things that we noticed when we first started working on this issue was the number of quote unquote accidental shootings that happen in the home because guns aren't put away. And we'll talk about that more in a little, in a little bit, but we also register voters because we want our voters to be informed and responsible and educated. So we were playing defense, as I stated, on gun bills for a long time. Uh, we started to see the reemergence of the campus carry bill, which would allow concealed carry permit holders to take their firearms onto college and university campuses, which is one of the worst ideas possible. You have students on campus who party, they, um, are experimenting with all sorts of things for the first time, let's face it. You have uh, students who are going through being away from home the first time and unbelievable stress. You, you know that you, we I know about the, 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 stu the studies that have been done on depression among young, young people. So you don't wanna have guns in these instances. And there was a shooting many years ago 
it may have been 2010 at a fraternity house at Florida State University, a student brought out a, a firearm at a party uh, and his girlfriend was one of two sisters. They were twins. He brought out his AK-47 to show it off and the gun went off and killed one of the twin sisters who died in her twins' arms. So that was an absolute tragedy. And as a result of that, and there was a campus bill moving at that time, the FSU president met with the NRA lobbyist and said, I cannot get behind this because at the time, actually, he was not the FSU president. He was in the um, legislature. And he said that we cannot get behind this bill because you know he personally knew that family personally and unfortunately that's what it sometimes takes to get um our our citizens convinced that the easy access to firearms has to be restricted is a tragedy so that bill went away that year but it came back in 2015 and we partnered with the campaign and we worked heavily to keep the guns off campus. And I will tell you that the bills went through the committees and they would continue to pass in committee. But when they got to the Senate committee, there was a, rep or a senator from Miami-Dade who blocked them. And that was terrific. It happened a couple of years in a, in a row. Then the emergence of open carry. What would open carry do? the bills on open carry. Well, they would allow those concealed permit holders to openly carry their firearms in public. So Florida is a tourism state. You start allowing open carry out, for example, by the international or the uh, international drive area, which is if you've ever been to Orlando, it's near Disney. What are tourists coming to Florida for the first time going to think when they see all of these people walking around with firearms? The only place that you can legally openly carry a firearm in Florida is if you are hunting or fishing. We blocked those bills with the help of some great partners. We blocked courthouse carry. They actually filed a bill to allow people to put their, take their concealed weapons to a, a courthouse. They'd have to be checked at the door, but it was a terrible idea for obvious reasons. Uh, An airport carry, good grief. I mean, just after Pulse, the same year at the airport down in Fort Lauderdale, there was a shooting at the airport. The last thing you want to do is allow these permits or holders to carry firearms in the airport. The argument for, oh, we need them for security purposes. There are security guards at the airport and civilians cannot stop. They do not have the training to stop these mass shooters. They simply do not. If you've ever looked into the concealed carry courses that are uh, held in Florida to get a permit, and we did a close look at them, it's depending on where you go to get your permit, sometimes the class, quote unquote, is 20 minutes. Sometimes it's an hour. It's usually facilitated by an NRA instructor. You may shoot the gun once. It may be a paint gun. There you go, here's your concealed carry permit. And Florida has one of the highest uh, rates of concealed carry permits in the country, if not the highest. We've gone back and forth between Florida and Texas. So those bills were defeated and I'm happy to say that now that we have got uh, a presence with the coalition and other partners working so hard to defeat bad gun bills and we have had our sponsors of the assault weapons ban, the, the Carlos Guillermo Smith in the House and Senator Gary Farmer in the Senate put those bills forward year after year. And guess what happens? They do not get a hearing. And that's what happens when you don't have parity in the legislature. Everything is just blocked at a standstill. So we continue to bring them back year after year and hope for at least a hearing. Hear the bills. So that, that is a continuing fight. But we are seeing the positive here that I wanted to bring up is that the positive about the, uh, the filing of the gun bills is that at one time, as I mentioned, it was just bad policy. Bad bills that would turn into terrible policy, terrible law. 
Now, this past legislative session, we saw uh, a number of gun bills fi uh, filed, probably about 30 to 40. Uh, mo most of the gun bills were gun safety bills. Were they passed? Not necessarily, but they were filed. After the Marjory Stoneman Douglas shooting, that uh, led to some gun legislation being put through the legislature for the first time in many, many years. And the coalition worked with some legislators to organize that huge rally on Tallahassee where so many students from Parkland drove up to Tallahassee uh, for many hours and sat and watched as our legislature shut down uh, an assault weapons ban and wept. But some legislation was passed, uh, the raising the from 18 to 21 by a long gun uh, and the extreme risk protection order known as a red flag law, which we really prefer that that is not used. That term red flag is, is sort of inappropriate. The problem with the extreme risk protection order in Florida is it needs to be strengthened. It allows the court, the uh, police officer to determine whether the court should be petitioned to take the gun away from somebody who is a domestic abuser and is a danger to him or herself uh, or the partner in the home, for example. And the best risk, extreme risk protection orders, the, the family member or, or the significant other or whoever is threatened can petition the judge directly. But in Florida, you must go through a law enforcement officer. So we believe that that needs to be strengthened. So Molly, I, be I believe that you are taking it. No, you're not taking it. Yes, I'm coming back. It was just, it was super hot in here. Okay, so uh, yes. So um, I also, I, I just wanted to add, um, Patty has to field a lot of calls or texts for me. Um, session um, because some of the things that some of the bills that show up are so uh, incredibly preposterous but also scary um, including uh, allowing uh, a gun and I have a preschooler allowing guns in preschools so I'll furiously type her and say oh my god do I have to pull my son you know I'm just terrified um, and, uh, like she said, it's, uh, it's a game of offense. I mean, we it just, it's, it was, it, I never understood this. Um, she, uh, has, uh, I mean, this has just been such a great, uh, uh, learning, uh, uh, experience for me because, you know, you're not necessarily going to have to fight every fight. You're just going to meet it at every turn, meet it at every committee. So anyway, um, uh, USA gun deaths. Uh, in 2018, uh, 40,000, almost 40,000 people died from guns. Two thirds of those deaths were suicides. Um, woman is shot and killed every 16 hours by an intimate partner in this country. Women in the U.S. are 21 times more likely to be killed by a gun than women in other high income countries. Uh, each year, 1,700 children and teens die by gun homicides. Um, over 1 million shot in the last decade and 1 million more witnessed firsthand. Exposure to gun violence equals lasting trauma and PTSD. I can uh, tell you in my experience, um, when I was working for newspapers, I uh, came to the scene where uh, I, I worked in a really rural area in uh, the deep south of Mississippi and Louisiana. And it was, it's hard to believe as it is, um, the police had been, uh, had arrived to that home uh, nine times for uh, domestic violence and uh, domestic violence calls. And, um, they, uh, the mother, uh, in defense of the child, uh, took his hunting w uh, rifle and shot him in front of the son. And when I showed up, 
to photograph uh, kind of a scene. I didn't think the sun would be there. I had no intention of photographing the family. Um, and he was in a police car and he was being um, driven away. And it was the most stoic, uh, just numb face I've ever seen. I've seen a lot of uh, people post tragedy, post you know, car fatalities and everything. But this was, this was unlike anything I had ever seen. It was just a nine year old. And I just, uh, I, I wanna stress the PTSD and the cost of gun violence in, uh, in mental health. So anyway, uh, next slide, please. Uh, Florida gun facts. So um, a gun is stolen every 26 minutes. Uh, we are third in the nation, three, uh, for gun thefts. And we have the highest rate of road rage with a firearm, which I kind of, I mean, we all kind of, probably not that surprised. Um, a child is shot every 17 hours and it is the second leading cause of death in uh, for Florida and nationwide. So um, next slide, please. Leading cause of death for children in the US, number one uh, is motor vehicle, and number two is firearms. Uh, that's all before cancer. Again, bringing, back, bringing this back to public health, um, Cancer, drownings, and poison. Uh, so, um, public health campaigns help reduce deaths and injuries in vehicle crashes and drownings for children. Uh, progress has been made, in, as we know, um, uh, uh, in treating pediatric cancer, um, but no progress has been made on our most vulnerable, on saving our most vulnerable victims. Uh, we've uh, spent millions on car seats and education and drowning and uh, poisoning. We have, um, I've, I've called, I've called the, you know, the poison control hotline. Um, but uh, for the CDC up until, up until the end of 2019, um, guns uh, as the, um, Number two killer was absent from the conversation. Next slide, please. So uh, this is so uh, unbelievable. By the time a child is five, guns are the second leading cause of death. By the time a child is 14, he, is, he or she is nearly as likely to die from a gunshot wound as in a car crash. For children under the age of 13, gun homicides most frequently occur in the home. So for everything uh, we worry about in school shootings, and I'm not negating this, but they are because of um, the prevalence and unlocked, in my opinion, uh, guns, um, gun homicides, again, are more frequently going to occur in the home. In Florida, a child is shot on average every 17 hours. And I think, Patty, you're gonna take this. Patty? Yes, I believe that I will. I believe that Molly, you address quite a bit of this, but we uh, do know that we have a serious problem with children accessing firearms that are not locked up. This happens way, way too often. And, <clears throat> excuse me, when we started working on this issue in Florida, we, one of the first things we did was really look into what is going on with children getting these guns in the home. And we started meeting with police chiefs and some sheriffs. And they told us that, well, this is a second degree misdemeanor, but it really doesn't have any teeth in it because the 
statue, there you go, there you see it. The firearm, it has to be securely locked or in a secure location, except when a person carries a gun on their body or there's a supervisor around and there's a second degree misdemeanor. So we're saying, well, wh why isn't this being at least enforced? And why isn't this taken more seriously? And why is this such a weak penalty? And we were told by a number of police chiefs when they get to the scene that it's such a tragedy for the parents usually because they blame themselves often for the child having get gotten a hold of a weapon and that they just are often not able to bring themselves to bring charges. And of course, the state attorney is involved usually in that decision making. So we knew that we had to look into raising as much awareness as possible about this issue as, the, as we could, about locking up somebody's weapon. It's critical to human life. We took a look at gun stores and if they were prominently placing these trigger locks and gun safes in the store. We did a survey statewide of about 30 to 35 gun stores from Pensacola all the way down to Miami. And we found out, and we, we focused on mostly independent stores, but we did do some of the big box stores that, that were selling firearms. And we found out that more than half of these stores were not placing prominently the trigger locks. They were not, you, you had to look around to, to find the safes. At one store we went to, we asked, do you have any trigger locks? Oh, well, let me try to find it. And the guy had them in a garbage bag behind the counter. Now, some of the stores would give them away with the purchase of a firearm. We knew this was very bad. They were also supposed to place the statute about keeping your weapon under lock and key at the point of purchase. Some of these stores did not do that. So we released our findings to the press and raised a lot of attention about this issue, which still needs to be raised because we continue to see children uh, and teenagers getting a hold of weapons, not understanding that these are dangerous or teenagers playing around with them, not understanding the danger and uh, accidentally, you could say, shooting themselves or a parent or a, uh, a sibling. And also in talking, uh, looking at this, we did a, had a talk with the um, physician, a coroner who, that there really is no such thing as an accident when it comes to these shootings. They are preventable. These shootings are preventable. They are not accidental. There are very few accidents in life and these are not among them. So we turn to the issue of suicide. Easy access to firearms for someone who is seriously depressed is a very dangerous situation. When there is an attempt of suicide uh, with a firearm, 85 to 90 percent of the time, it is a fatal, it, it is a true suicide. It's not just an attempt, it happens, it goes through, whereas, you know, overdose, as you see on the slide, about 20 percent of drug overdoses lead to death. We have a huge problem with suicide. It's been on the rise in this country. We're concerned about this certainly under COVID because depression is, is, is happening at greater rates. There is a lot of confusion around suicide. And I will tell you that when I was a younger woman, quite a bit younger, I worked at a suicide prevention center and I also volunteered for it for 11 years and learned a lot about the issue of suicide. If you, the suicidal person is usually not mentally ill, that there is a lot mythology around that. You don't have to be mentally ill to be suicidal. Something happens that's situational. There's a loss of life that you're mourning uh, or you lose your job or you lose your, your, your home. You're more likely to become depressed. So we looked hard at the issue of suicide and, and why there were 
so many of them, and what we could do to prevent them. And the studies have shown that if you have a 15 minute window between the impulse, which suicide is usually impulsive act, between the impulse of committing suicide and the actual act, if you have that 15 minute window, you can slow that impulse down. And one of the ways that you slow that impulse down is you keep a gun locked up and you keep the gun locked up separately from the bullets. You keep those in a separate place. That in and of itself can slow down a suicidal person and they can come out the other side to wait, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Because what we've learned about suicide is a temporary. Suicidal people, excuse me, what we learned about suicidal tendencies, tendencies is that they are temporary. They are quickly moving through the mind. And that if the person come outside of the, can come outside of that, that window of time, that person usually goes on not to make an attempt. And that is extremely important when it comes to firearms because firearms make it all too easy to carry out the act of suicide. And here, as you see, the risk is 10 times greater in the United States. And this is what happens when you have a culture that is awash with firearms as we are. Uh, suicides in states with high gun ownership. Well, that makes sense because it is the most uh, effective way to take one's own life. So we, we advocate strongly to not keep a firearm uh, locked at the same, in the same place as those bullets. Because if you have to go to two different places to get the bullets and the firearm, that's gonna slow down a suicidal person. The suicide among young people is a very serious issue. And that is another reason that we fought so hard the guns on campus bills, because we knew that we would see a rise in suicides. Look at those numbers on ad adolescent suicide. Teenagers, if there's a loaded unlocked firearm in the home, four times more likely. At the beginning of, uh, before this call, one of the, your league members shared that she, suffered a, a death of a friend and colleague. And I will share with you that when I was a, a teenager, I had a boyfriend who became deeply depressed. Now this is back, well, I won't tell you what decade, but this was back when guns were not fetishized the way that they are in our society now. And a lot of that fetish has become, has come right out of the National Rifles Association's marketing to make guns uh, carrying and gun ownership uh, you know, either sexy or to make people convinced that, you know, the only way they can keep themselves safe is by owning a gun when all evidence to the contrary. It's just not true. So we know that, again, look at that number, only one in 10 survivors will try suicide. It's critical that we uh, do as much education as we can around this issue. Because when we're talking about gun violence, we're not just talking about gun violence to some, you know, somebody committing homicide. We're also talking about someone committing suicide. They're committing violence upon themselves. And we know that the rates of suicide are going up and that a society awash in firearms is, is just going to make the situation far worse. The other thing to keep in mind about this is it's really important to note that, that we do not want to stigmatize this issue. Mental health issues, issues are already carry a stigma. And there is this myth out there that most people who commit, say for example, mass shootings or suicide are mentally ill. Well, there is some truth to the matter that a suicidal person or somebody who has a weapon and is mentally ill is far more dangerous to themselves than another person. I mean, that is absolutely true. But uh, we cannot demonize or stigmatize the mentally ill by saying that they are the ones who are going to go after, uh, you know, the public with these mass shootings because that is a myth. It also is. Uh, there are more domestic violence shootings in the home than there are these mass shootings. 
So, and then of course the, the definition of mass shooting has changed somewhat. I believe it's now four or more people is considered a mass shooting. So there's a lot of mythology that we need to look at around this issue of mental illness, suicide, and, and firearms to be able to educate the public properly. Veteran suicide. This is a huge problem. And we know that the, those who have served in the military, many of them who have seen war, they uh, have suffered or will suffer post-traumatic stress disorder and suffer terrible depression as a result. And they are far more dangerous to themselves than they are other people. And look at that number on average. 20 veterans commit suicide each day in this country with a gun. These numbers have to change. We have to do a better job of protecting our veterans. The, these, once again, these types of suicides are preventable with better mental health. And of course, we all know that Florida is, when it comes to mental health funding, we're down at the 49th or 50, the bottom. So we need to raise awareness about mental health issues while, again, not stigmatizing not saying that you are mentally ill if you fire a weapon or commit suicide, but provide mental health treatment. There is a difference between mental health treatment and mental illness. Back to you, Molly. Uh, so we're at domestic violence, okay. Um, so I can, Kind of bring it back to that story uh, I was telling you before. Um, uh, as I said, this was uh, in a, another state. It was uh, 17 years ago, but um, the police had been called to that home uh, nine times, had never removed the guns. Um, so I, I, I want to piggyback off what she said, what Patty said, and uh, and, uh, the NRA's uh, playbook is always okay. Rush to the rush to the mental illness. Find the mental illness. Um, however, it's not uh, uh, how many times people have reached out for help. It's not how many times uh, and been ignored. It's not how many times people have said take this gun. Uh, and uh, and I was on a Zoom call last night. And uh, someone was applying for a, um, a extreme risk protection order. This wasn't in our state, but this woman came with her boyfriend. And so you would think the, you know, obvious and uh, that, that this was a domestic violence issue. And um, no, she said, he is profoundly depressed and I need you to take his gun. Um, because if you don't, he will not be with me. So, uh, as it says, presence of a firearm, increased risk of a death for a domestic violence victim by as much as 500%. Um, um, I, 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 it, it, again, to piggyback off what uh, Patty said, um, at, like the police were saying, well, we kind of, it's such a horrible situation, we don't want to, we don't want to uh, uh, file charges. I worked for newspapers who said, hey, if you, uh, I just, like, for example, I went to um, uh, the house of a grandmother where um, one little boy, um, a, a six-year-old shot his three-year-old uh, cousin. They were visiting, you know, cousins visiting grandmother. And, uh, and they said, we're not running any photos from this. That's, that is, that's tasteless. And, and we can't, and it's, you know, it's victimizing uh, the victims, et cetera. Um, so uh, I, I could argue now, looking back in hindsight, saying um, we could have said they're not, again, this is not a shame game. This is an education. So uh, uh, I guess, no, it, let, let me just say uh, in 2013, New York enacted a law that requires New York's uh, uh, gun laws um, 
are some of the most progressive in this in this nation, by the way. Uh, New York enacted a law that requires a firearm owner to keep his or her firearm locked if he or she lives with a con convicted felon, a domestic abuser, or a person with a federally prohibitive mental health history. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, this is really problematic. Gun theft is on the rise. It's, um, it's um, strange, uh, uh, and I don't know if you all have experienced this, but a lot of um, automobile thefts now, where people are going in and um, raiding your car. Um, I knew there was this big outbreak of it in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Tallahassee, and nothing's taken. Uh, it happened in Winter Park, um, where two children uh, were going around, breaking into cars, and then they'll leave cash, everything. They're looking for guns. Uh, so more than 230,000 guns were stolen in 2016. Uh, nationwide, a gun is stolen every two minutes. That is a major problem, obviously, for tracing. And um, uh, as it says, most stolen guns are taken from homes and unlocked cars. Uh, many are used in crimes uh, by people prohibited from possessing guns. and um, if we safely stored our guns, uh, we could help reduce the deaths. So I can't remember. I think, am I taking this or are you, Patty? I can't remember. You are. Okay. So the amazing Barbara Markley uh, uh, at uh, the League of Women Voters in our Broward uh, chapter, uh, along with Deborah Davis, uh, it, it launched a program called Lock It Up. And uh, we've discussed this before. Um, uh, she has, let's see, how, what's her last? Uh, nearly 14,000 locks, two years, 14,000 locks. That was her latest number. I asked her the other day. Um, she is at health fairs, she is at Nancy Granda, Granda you know, um, uh, we've talked about this so much in our calls. Um, she's, she, she, there's nowhere she won't go. It's just if people will let her in. Um, but, uh, and Deborah Davis, you're on this call, I think, um, you know, it's just anyone who will take one, uh, she's trying to give them. What also she is trying to do, and, and this is important for everyone um, in their chapter, is make this a self-sustaining program. So um, it started uh, for her with um, Veterans Affairs, um, getting uh, the locks from Veterans Affairs, and, um, and them having so many, and them just saying, yeah, we support the cause. Get them out however you can. Um, Personally, uh, I, every time there is a, um, a, there's a lot of terms for it, and I don't like the word friendly fire, but um, there's, but you'll hear friendly fire or family fire um, is, you know, when someone gets a, gets a gun in the house, so, you know, kids playing, kids are over for a play date and someone gets an unlocked gun. Uh, I'll post that you know, that story, and I'll say, okay, this is horrific. Who needs a gun lock? And um, this has been the biggest uh, eye-opener for me is how many people have contacted me. And, and, uh, and one of the things I say is I always say, there's no shame. You remain anonymous. This is, this is a league program. I just so happen to have them. Um, and take as many as you need. I have friends who have given them to their uh, friends who uh, know that um, problematic marriages. Uh, they're in 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 um, in in, in uh, kind of uh, bad situations. I have uh, I have friends who have, and I say friends, you know. 
uh, we all have Facebook acquaintance um, who said, oh, you know, my, my father-in-law gave me this gun. I, I feel really, you know, rude. It's been in the family forever. Uh, I don't want to give it back to him. He wants my kids to have it. Uh, can I take, can I take a lock? I meet them or I drop it off in their mailbox. No questions asked. Um, but, you know, having those and having the ability to make this, um, you know, not a shame game, just we're all on the same team. We all want the same result, right? We all want to save lives. So um, Barbara's program is amazing. And, um, and oh, there's this whole nother Zoom just to talk about what, what the Broward League has done. But anyway. It really is. And Molly, I'd like to add something here that if you are a parent or you are a guardian of a child and your, your, your child has a playmate and is going over to, well, it's a little bit difficult right now with COVID, but the practice should be, if your child is going to a friend's house to play with, a, you need to ask that parent, do you own a weapon? And if you do, do you keep it stored? That's where prevention comes in as well. You need to be proactive and make sure that anywhere your child goes, that if there is a firearm in the home, it is locked up. Otherwise, there's a risk there. So please, before you go out or before your child goes to visit his or her friend, ask that parent. I realize it may be an uncomfortable situation, but it's about saving lives. Do you own a firearm? And can I just ask you, do you keep it in a safe place? I just want to make sure that our children stay safe. I, I as a parent of small children, I will I'll just say, um, I, of course, do the ask. And, uh, and I encourage others to do it. But what's funny is um, people are more and more like, you got to see how great my situation is. I mean, I have friends who have it completely hidden where you don't even see the safe. And then I have other friends who are like, I spent so much money on this safe and they're so proud. And I, I love that they're as excited about it because again, it is a team effort. We're all, we all have to do uh, our part. So uh, Barbara always says, if your kids can find your Christmas gifts, they can find your guns. So are we, uh, so this wrap up for you, Molly. What we want to do, everybody, is we want to lower the risk of these preventable shootings. And I, I think that we're going to change this slide because there's no such thing as an accidental shooting, especially with children. They are preventable shootings. We want to lower the risk of domestic violence shootings. We want to lower the risk of suicides, obviously of homicides and these gun thefts which are, is, a, is a serious issue, as Molly stated, because these gun thefts mean the guns are getting into the wrong hands, and we've got to prevent that from happening. If you have a firearm and you keep it locked up in your car, well, first of all, make sure it's locked up and make sure you lo lock your car. So there are citations. I'm sure Molly will provide uh, them to you if you have any questions about where this data came from. And we both want to thank you very much for asking us to make this presentation. And we certainly know that some of you may have questions and we are very happy to answer them. Uh, will our hostesses of the chat box please come forward? Uh, we have a number of uh, comments, not so many questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Mary, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I have, uh, I was, this is Mary, I'll be taking the first question and I noticed that there were some comments, but the first question you get in, is, is there any research that discusses police response in communities that are unarmed as opposed to in communities that are heavily armed? I'll let Molly take that. Molly, you're muted. Sorry, guys. 
Um, uh, that, that obviously is a hot topic right now. And um, uh, I can't say I know of that research. And I think that's a good um, thing to ask. Um, again, I'm just going to say blanket voting save, saves lives, right? Um, and the reason I say that is because black and brown communities are underrepresented in our voting and uh and our voting access so um what um the response is um for police is uh in that situation i i don't know but i will just i just of course i want to put a plug in for voting and um if that question has a has an angle anyway um there's another question about um uh, the statistics and and uh, after getting that uh, specific question I'd like to broaden it uh, the question is from Maria Boyce and she asks if the number of deaths that we're counting includes uh, victims killed by police shooting Patty? Patty you would be the person to answer that question I I Unfortunately, uh, I'm going to assume in this situation all firearm deaths. I would not uh, believe they would take out any contributing data. I, was um, gonna, I would say that we need to take a look at that data and get back to you with that. We can take a note of who asked that question to make sure that we get the data and make sure that the police are uh, that we respond to your question. Thank you. That's, Maria, that's from Maria Boyce. And, and um, there, you know, there is some confusion. You mentioned the, the Dickey Amendment. And uh, is my understanding, and I'd like to clarify, is, is just that the CDC, uh, which is our agency that's responsible for public health, um, is not funding any uh, gun violence related research. But nonetheless, uh, without uh, so uh, a kind of a uniform approach, there are some numbers and there is research uh, going on, but, but as far as keeping, you know, requiring reporting from a federal level, you know, there's no other through Justice Department or, um, you know, because I had even read, for instance, that um, the the resale of police guns is a huge problem mm -hmm. and that uh, these guns are being used to commit other violent crimes by people who are not uh, allowed to otherwise carry weapons and this is not being tracked. The Department of Justice does not require that police departments uh, track um, where their guns are disposed of. That's a huge problem. Yes, you're absolutely correct. We're, I mean, the CDC does release numbers on um, the number of suicides via firearms versus the number of homicides. The number of suicides are higher than ho the number of, of, of homicides. At least that's the last time I looked at the data. Um, the other uh, issue that, that you're bringing up leads to the fact that we do have some very good researchers at some of the universities in our country. The Harvard School, uh, the Harvard, Harvard University's uh, public safety program, they do a lot of terrific research on gun violence. So does Johns Hopkins University, uh, and I'm sure others out in California, I believe there's some very good research being done at some of the universities and colleges out there. But we really do need, um, a very active research being done at the federal level. So we can do this sort of tracking because without the kind of data that would, that the federal government would, would have, uh, it, it's really hard to know exactly how bad this problem is other than by gathering various data from various locations. And, and that gun violence has exploded in this, pro in this country as a huge problem. And we need to be treating it as a public health crisis. Doctors and physicians are saying this, that it is a public health crisis. 
but we seldom hear from uh, the new Surgeon General on this. Uh, essentially, you know, a lot of our leaders are, and I hate to use this term because it's, it's a terror, I don't mean a pun, but they're muzzled. I mean, they can't talk about this uh, without fear of retribution politically from the NRA. And the NRA, of course, is having its own problems right now, but they still are a force in this country. So yes, this is a serious issue. There should be ongoing research uh, done at the federal level because this problem has gotten worse, not better. I just um, ho hope I can piggyback off that. I just posted a book that I've been reading. Uh, it doesn't look like it showed up. I'll, I'll do another link to it. Unfortunately, um, I I've been taking a really long time to read it because it's so, there are so many outlines. It's called Private Guns, Public Health. And like Patty said, this is, the author is at um, Harvard. Harvard has a, has a, um, a devoted uh, public health uh, uh, program for um, gun violence that has been a tro given us a trove of evidence, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, data. Um, but this book, if you are interested in this, uh, it's, the most thorough book on the subject that I've read. And I can also add that we have a uh, league member in Palm Beach County, his name is Tom Gabor, who is a criminologist and has done, I don't know how many studies, he's from Canada, and he, many, many studies on guns. And, 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 and I believe he, he wrote a lot of the gun laws in Canada. And he's written about three books now that have been published by major publishing companies on this issue of gun violence. I believe his last book is called Enough. If you're interested in taking a look, uh, he's an excellent researcher, writer, and uh, very well, the peer reviews are very good for him. He got a great peer review uh, recommendation from Harvard. So his books are available online. His name is Tom Gabor, G-A-B like Bob, O-R. Yeah, I'm linking to that right now as well. He is, he's the, so much information there. Next question. Mary? I've got one from Deborah Kaufman. It says, in a, in a world where COVID-19 is still not a reportable disease in the state of Florida for the Department of Health, what are our next steps to even begin to convince health officials that this is a, a serious public health issue. That gun violence is a serious yeah. gun, right. Mm -hmm. What do we need to do to convince who, who exactly? Department of Health. They're not quite reporting, you know, the COVID situation. So what can we do to help them? Well, you know, m many health departments, you know, are overseen by county governments or city. Uh, and we also know that in Florida, uh, we have something called preemption that, uh, the, the league is a big believer in home rule that city and county uh, municipalities should be able to make their own rules on certain issues affecting their communities. And the NRA's power in Florida uh, on, on local municipalities doing anything about gun violence prevention or enacting any ordinances has been preempted by the state of Florida who came to NRA influence uh, and what it means is, is that a local government cannot enact any ordinances if they do to, you know, like you can't take a gun to a certain place. Okay, so th what's gonna happen? And this happened under the Rick Scott administration. What is going to happen? Well, number one, that ordinance, that local law will be null and void by the state. Secondly, that public official, or say it's the city council that voted on this, could lose their jobs, be fired, and they could be sued, and they would not, they would have to pay for their own court costs. Now, we saw a situation up in Tallahassee several years back where all the city council did, I believe, and my memory is a little bit cloudy, but um, all they did was uphold a an ordinance and i believe it had to do with guns in public parks well guess what happened uh they got sued by uh, the uh group uh florida carry 
and the NRA was a part of that lawsuit. And a number of organizations joined Friends of the Court Briefs, and uh, it was eventually tossed. But that just shows you the power of preemption. You can't do anything in the state of Florida. We have the most draconian preemption laws on firearms in the state of Florida. And that is according to the Giffords Law Center. So when you have those kind of punitive consequences to enacting any kind of firearm uh, or gun violence prevention in your community, you're really hamstrung as to what you can do. And then that includes your local departments of health, et cetera. Um, on the question uh, on the issue of uh, domestic violence and the vulnerability of women, especially to gun violence, um, Doris uh, Weatherford asked, I hope I got that name right, um, asked about the inclusion of uh, black women and any uh, outreach and information efforts. And, and I would also just add to that, um, how can we get information out to women um, especially women who are at risk uh, for gun violence, what protections they have. Some were mentioned in the presentation, but just to emphasize that and get that information in the right hands. There, there are a number of organizations devoted to domestic violence, and you just Google them, and they provide a lot of information about guns and domestic violence. If you are concerned about someone in a home who is, is maybe being abused and there's a gun, you have every right to call the National Center on Domestic Violence and report your concern. And they will look into it. I mean, and many families have to do it. It, it is often used. And of course, there is a lot of concern about domestic violence under COVID-19 because people, you know, <laughs> have been shelter in place and, and that's been eased up a bit in, in many parts of the, the state but or and, and we're talking about florida right now but really nationally there's a lot of concern about domestic violence in the home under covid because and usually let's face it the abuser is a man and you know here they are in an abusive situation with high stress levels and the concern is what's going on in the homes right now when you have a situation uh, where somebody is regularly abused and there's a gun in the home and there's once these shelters in place and some states have them still in place strongly for example out in california uh once they're lifted there's a lot of concern as to what people that these domestic violence centers are going to find out about what has happened in these homes okay. mary do you have anything else uh, I have another question, yep, by a Jean Iglesias. Um, it's part comment, part question. If legislatures think guns should not be restricted in any way, then why don't they allow them in the legislature? <laughs> and should legislatures be proposed that might wake them up or at least expose their hypocrisy? Well, that's an excellent question, and it's it's... <laughs> Then uh, the, the featured in some editorials over the years uh, in some newspapers in Florida. And actually, there have been some in, uh, bills introduced that would allow guns into the, the chambers. So you can take a gun into the Florida Capitol. It has to go through security if you have a concealed permit. You cannot take them into the chambers where the House and Senate meet. So there have been gun bills put forward by um, some pro-gun uh, legislators. And of course, those bills went nowhere. Even this past year. Yeah. And, the other, and the other legislators are like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Not so fast. We, we, like, we like everything else except that one. That one, no. Yeah. Great. Bravo, Jean. Um, I have one. I, think, I guess it will be our final question. Um, unless Mary has something else. Um, I just wondered in the, in the comments uh, made throughout the presentation and given the incidents, if we have found or can find that either police or the military are potential allies uh, with us in advocating for, for gun safety. Well, I can actually answer some of that and, and, and just a piece of that really. Um, after we formed the, the coalition, uh, the Florida Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence, we, and, and around the same time, there was a gentleman that, that joined the 
the action team in Orange County in the league on, on gun safety. He had worked in the Orange County Sheriff's Office for 32 years, and for much of that time, you know, he, he went and he became a school resource officer, which is a sheriff's deputy who can carry on, on a public school campus. He became one of the strongest advocates that we had for the a ban on semi-automatic assault weapons. Uh, we did a series of videos on uh, a ban on assault weapons and he was probably one of the strongest speakers. And, you know, he still will speak on this issue. He went out to the schools. Look, the advocates, we want gun owners to speak out on this issue. We want police to speak out on this issue. Now, sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. It depends on the law enforcement officer. So I can't answer this in a blanket way, but we have had uh, law enforcement officers as we, you know, when I was working on this issue full time, uh, that would speak out publicly. Uh, for example, in Tampa, the, the police chief at the time came out publicly against open carry. That was a number of years ago. Then again, you have other sheriffs in the state of Florida who advocate. We have, there was a sheriff in, in one of the counties, more rural counties in, in the state a couple of years ago, who put a video up on his Facebook page about, uh, you know, everybody should carry, everybody. It's the incredibly reckless messaging uh, from particular sheriff. So it depends on the law enforcement officer. You know, it it, it's all dependent on that person. And also we have to remember that sheriffs are elected. Now, not everywhere, but many places sheriffs are elected. So that is an elected office. And this turns into a political issue. Uh, at, uh, police chiefs are often appointed, but they're still internal politics. So Unfortunately, gun violence prevention and gun safety has turned into a political issue and a partisan issue when I will bring it back to what it really should be, which is a public safety issue. And we have been saying this for years and we will continue to say it, that this is not a partisan issue. It should not ever be made into a political issue. What it should be considered, seen as is a public safety issue. Can I add to that? Uh, a lot of, of the police officers uh, believe in, um, in ERPO and can be our best uh, advocates because the most dangerous place for a, a police officer to arrive is a domestic violence call. So, um, I, I t Patty and I were talking about this earlier today, but um, we Building our relationships and our communication with uh, law enforcement only serves our, uh, our cause. Yes, and same with gun owners. Uh, you know, it's important to note that we don't want to demonize all gun owners. Uh, it, you know, you pass a background check and we can't demonize all gun owners. We know there are flaws in the, gun, the background check system. There's no doubt about it that it needs to be strengthened but we can't demonize all of them. And it, it, it's not right to do that because some of the strongest advocates that we could have out there on gun safety would be gun owners. And it would be great to have more of them step forward. I had one last question come in. It was, does anybody know if um, smoking ever was made into a political issue? I that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Right. I'm sure there were politics around it. There are some excellent uh, literature out there on it that I recommend. And uh, it was a long fight to get even smoking banned or smoking advertisements banned from TV and magazine. So it took a long time. And of course, the uh, tobacco lobby was coming out saying, oh, it's will cause cancer and you know lying about it it's very similar to what the NRA does about gun violence it's a, it, that's a good a good analogy and that was it for the questions well thank you 
I want to thank you very much for joining us tonight. Molly has done a great job as the state gun safety chair. Uh, I want to thank the Hillsborough League for, for hosting this event. I just want to say that that we all have a duty in our society. We all have a duty to one another. We have a duty to ourselves to keep each other as safe as possible. And when when I began doing this work several years ago, I, I heard people say, there is nothing you can do, nothing, because the gun lobby owns everything. Well, you know, there is something we can do. And first of all, we need to shed more light on just how the gun lobby operates. Unfortunately, that's been happening over the years with a number of books being published about them. And now news coming about all of the, the mishandlings going on at, in, at their, their uh, organization and, and busting them on some of the the myths that they put out there they call themselves the oldest civil rights organization in the country there's very little to do with civil rights and the and national rifle association they started out actually as a gun safety organization training people on proper use of weapons and then they became politicized in the um 80s and 90s and became all about selling guns and this is what it's all about it all comes down to money patty, so we have to remember that patty can i interject here there's a great film called guns greed in the nra and i would suggest anyone that can get their hands on it to, to watch it it's pretty uh, yeah. frightening actually thank you grace and actually the league has shown that in a number of locations oh, around the okay. state Guns Read and the NRA, and it does show you the, the, uh, the stories of some victims of gun violence, a domestic violence survivor, uh, and just how the gun lobby operates and how it uh, rewards its, its, its members and how it gins up its base. People think that this is all about payment to the legislators. This is not necessarily the case. The gun lobby, the NRA, has a grading system where after the legislative session is over in, here in Florida, they will grade a lawmaker on their performance on their gun activity. And if they do anything, if they vote for the, the simplest of a gun measure, like, you know, a gun safety uh, bill that would strengthen the, uh, the statute on keeping children safe from firearms and safe storage is what the, the, the phrase I was looking for. Even to strengthen safe storage, something like that, they would get a lower grade from the NRA. And, and those grades, it may sound silly, but a lot of those legislators take them very seriously. And the lobby, the gun lobby, the NRA in Florida uses those grades against them. So the best thing that you can do is to follow, you know, what is happening in your legislator, legislature and what is happening with your legislators. And the league often puts out action alerts when we see uh, legislation moving on our many issues that either we are very much in favor of or that we very much are against. And we do have the power, by the way, don't listen to anybody who says there's nothing you can do because that is completely untrue. You can pick up the phone if you get an action alert and, and say, stop this bill that's going to place guns on your public school campuses where we've seen some of those or an open carry bill and on and on. And you can pick up the phone and you can call your legislator. You can call of all of the members on the committee who's going to hear the bill. You can write them emails. We, we uh, actually really recommend jamming their phone lines with phone calls. And another thing that you can do is get to know your legislators. Start meeting with them in their districts before they even go into committee hearings. Uh, and certainly before they go into the legislative session. It's really important to introduce yourself to your legislator. And as, certainly as league members, you know, we, we do meet with our legislators often and let them know, you know, we are really concerned about this issue and, and we want to hear, hear what you think about this issue. You know, can we look for support on um, ex background check expansion? We need to hold our legislators accountable because they work for us and they are accountable to the voters.
Patty, let me interject on that. You know, you're talking about the NRA giving a ranking to all of their members who have done anything for them. Um, Moms Demand Action also has um, uh, done sense candidates of distinction rankings. And you can actually go online and look gun sense candidates in your area, and they will give you a check of all those uh, who are running for office who have that kind of distinction with hoping that they will uh, legislate with gun sense, you know, uh, initiatives. Thank you very much, Grace. I will say that the league does not do that. Uh, the league has to be careful. We are a nonpartisan organization. We do not take candidate positions ever. Uh, but we do it's not taking a position. All it is is saying that they may legislate with gun sense um, initiatives. Thank so, we're you. Not, so you make your own decision after that, I guess. Well, we do encourage voters to educate themselves about uh, how our uh, elected officials or the candidates, what their positions are on the issues we put in our voter guide every election cycle, legislative questions to the, the candidates uh, and ask them about various issues and one of them is guns and, and allow the public to uh, make their own determinations on whether they're gonna vote in favor or not. Okay, if there are no more uh, questions on behalf of the Hillsborough League, Patty and Molly, thank you so very much. The comments in the chat box have been highly uh, positive and supportive. So we appreciate you taking the time to uh, provide this information. Before we adjourn, uh, I'd like to uh, note that the Hillsborough League's next event will occur on October 20th on the national popular vote. And this will also be a virtual event and it will begin at 5.30 p.m and registration details will be forthcoming. If Shirley R. Curie is still with us, uh, I might ask if she'd like to add anything else to that announcement. Well, maybe not. <laughs> uh, to, uh, we thank you all to our participants. Uh, this is a very important topic and any harm to any one of us is harm to all of us and we must address that harm so stay safe and good night thank you thank you very much thank you thank you